I'm Benjamin Wieselowski and I'm going to talk about the supersingular isogeny path problem and the endomorphism ring problem and how these two problems are equivalent. I'm going to start with a few preliminaries on isogeny-based cryptography, what are isogenies, and what are elliptic curves. First, elliptic curves. So I'm going to fix a finite field here, FQ, for the rest of the talk. FQ is just the finite field with Q elements. Now, an elliptic curve over this finite field FQ is the set of all solutions xy of an equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, a and b being parameters that define the elliptic curve. These elliptic curves are curves with an additional structure. They are an additive group. So if you are given two points on the curve, you can add them to form a third point. So we're talking about elliptic curves over finite fields in this talk, but if you want to uh, draw a picture over the real numbers, a typical elliptic curve looks like this. And you have an addition on it, which means that if you're given two points P and Q, there is a way to construct a third point, P plus Q. Now isogenies. Isogenies are simply maps between elliptic curves. If you are given two elliptic curves E and F, an isogeny sends points on E to points of F. It's not just any map, it's maps that preserve certain structures. In particular, we want this map to be a group homomorphism. On top of being group homomorphisms, they have stronger properties, like they always have finite kernel over algebraically closed fields. And it allows to define the degree. We say that the degree of an isogeny phi is the size of this kernel, which we know is always a finite number. Now an endomorphism is an isogeny from a curve to itself. Okay, now with these structures, we know how to build some cryptosystems. Cryptosystems, in a sense, based on isogeny problems. So what exactly does it mean to be based on an isogeny problem? So here's an isogeny problem. In the first square here, you see the problem. When you're given E and F, can you find an isogeny between E and F? That's the isogeny finding problem. You're just given the curves and you are asked to find an isogeny between these two. And you can construct cryptosystems that are secure as long as this isogeny finding problem is hard. Now you have a very similar problem involving endomorphisms. So now you're just given one elliptic curve E and you are asked to find endomorphisms of E, so isogenies from E to itself. And that's the endomorphism problem. And now if you can solve this endomorphism problem, then cryptosystems are broken. So in a sense, it's the converse as the first relation we had. So if isogeny finding is hard, cryptosystems are secure. And if endomorphism problems are easy, then cryptosystems are broken. The issue is that now we have relations between the security of cryptosystems and two different problems. So what we would be hoping for is for these two problems to be equivalent. And this is the problem we're tackling in this work, showing that they are equivalent. So I need to say a bit more about endomorphisms. Remember, an endomorphism is an isogeny from an elliptic curve to itself. That allows the set of all endomorphisms of a given curve to have the structure of a ring. So we fix E, we write end of E for the set of all endomorphisms of the elliptic curve, and now we have an addition which is given by pointwise addition, and a multiplication which is given by composition of endomorphisms, since they have the same domain and codomain and they can always be composed together. Okay, so what kind of objects do we have in this ring? We have endomorphisms from E to itself, and we have very explicit examples of that. For instance, if you pick any integer m, there is an endomorphism of E, which is multiplication by m. We write it with square brackets, so square brackets m is the endomorphism of E that sends a point p to p plus itself m times. So given any integer m, we can construct an element from the endomorphism ring. And this construction is actually an embedding of the ring of integers inside the endomorphism ring. So what is the structure of this ring? So as I just said, it's a ring that contains z. That's not much information, but that's already non-trivial. It contains z, so in particular, it's an infinite ring. But we know much more. It's not just an infinite ring. We know that if we focus just on the additive structure, what we get is a lattice 
of dimension either 2 or 4. And this case distinction between dimension 2 or 4 is the key behind the definition of supersingular. We say that an elliptic curve E is supersingular when we are in the case where the, the endomorphism ring has dimension 4. And this is the case we are going to look at for the rest of the talk. Everything will be supersingular, all the endomorphism rings will have dimension 4. Okay, so that tells us everything there is to know about the additive structure of the endomorphism ring. But it doesn't say anything about the multiplication. So let's use our new knowledge. We know the additive structure, we know it's a four-dimensional lattice, so there is a basis of the endomorphism ring that consists in four elements. And we can always take the first basis element to be one, the identity endomorphism. Now the endomorphism ring decomposes as this direct sum of copies of Z thanks to these basis elements. Now we want to understand the multiplicative structure of this ring. And this is a much more complicated matter than understanding the additive structure. And to do it, we need to move to a simpler object. The endomorphism ring is a lattice. We can look at it as in living in a simpler object called the endomorphism algebra, which is the vector space spanned by the lattice. So whenever you had a z in the decomposition of the endomorphism ring, you replace, this with, you replace it with q, the field of rationals. So now you get a rational vector space, still of dimension 4, and you call it b, the endomorphism algebra. So why is it called an endomorphism algebra? Because it's not only a vector space, it also has a multiplication. And the multiplication of elements in the endomorphism algebra is simply the one induced by the multiplication in the endomorphism ring. So composition of endomorphisms. So now you have the endomorphism algebra B, which is a four-dimensional vector space with a multiplication. And we are hoping that this object is simpler to understand than the endomorphism ring, because now it's a vector space instead of a lattice. And it is indeed simpler to understand. If you give me a supersingular elliptic curve over a field of characteristic P, then it is very easy to compute its endomorphism algebra. We know that the endomorphism algebra of this curve is always the object called the quaternion algebra ramified at P and infinity. Here I call it uh, BP infinity. So if you don't know what the quaternion algebra is or what ramified at P and infinity means, it may be a little bit intimidating, but what this means is we have a very explicit description of this algebra. For instance, when p is congruent to 3 mod 4, bp infinity is simply the vector space of dimension 4 spanned by the basis 1, i, j, and k. So this already gives all the additive structure there is to know about the algebra. With multiplication that is given by the following rules, i squared is minus 1, j squared is minus p, and k is equal to i, j, which is equal to minus j, i. So these few multiplication rules, they tell you how to multiply any pair of elements in the algebra. So we understand perfectly the endomorphism algebra, it's easy to compute. Now what we're interested in is not quite the endomorphism algebra, but the endomorphism ring. And we know that the endomorphism ring is a discrete subring of the endomorphism algebra. It's not just any discrete subring, we know that it's maximal in some sense. It is a discrete subring that is not contained in any bigger discrete subring. We call it a maximal order of the quaternion algebra. So now there is hope that maybe the quaternion algebra has very few maximal orders and we can enumerate them and figure out which one is the endomorphism ring. Unfortunately, it's not quite the case. There are many maximal orders. So let's go through an example. Um, let's stick to P is 3 mod 4 because then we have the explicit description for the quaternion algebra that I gave you in the previous slide. We can choose a very explicit elliptic curve. Here I pick E0 to be y squared equals x cubed plus x. So this defines an elliptic curve, and we know that it is super singular. Can we hope to compute the endomorphism ring of this elliptic curve? I guess the obvious idea is to well, stare at the equation and try and find endomorphisms that preserve this equation. If you do that, there are two quite simple endomorphisms that you might find. 
the first one is observing that the elliptic curve E0 is defined over Fp. So you have the P Frobenius, the map that takes a point xy on the elliptic curve E0 and sends it to the point x to the power P, y to the power P. Since the elliptic curve is defined over Fp, it is indeed an endomorphism. You can try and compute how this endomorphism behaves. For instance, if you compose it with itself, what do you obtain? And if you do the computation, you will figure that applying the Frobenius twice is equivalent to multiplying by minus p. Writing it algebraically, you get pi squared equals minus p, and that looks a lot like the behavior of j in our quaternion algebra. We had j squared equals minus p, so maybe there is a correspondence between j in the quaternion algebra and pi in the endomorphism break. Now, can one find a second endomorphism of this curve? Well, there is a second very simple one. We can find a root of minus 1 in fp squared. So call it alpha, and you get alpha squared equals minus 1. Now, if you take a point xy on the curve E0, you will find that the point minus x alpha y is still on E0. In other words, sending xy to minus x alpha y is an endomorphism of E0. And similarly, you can try and understand the behavior of this endomorphism and apply it twice, and you will very easily find that i squared equals minus 1, which is a lot like the behavior of i in the endomorphism algebra. So now you can try and figure how these two endomorphisms behave with, behave with each other if you compose them with each other, and you will find that composing them in one order gives you the opposite as composing them is in the other order, just like ij equals minus ji in the endomorphism algebra. So you could maybe hope that these endomorphisms generate everything in your endomorphism algebra, in which case, thanks to all the relations, the relations we've checked between these endomorphisms, this would be isomorphic to the quaternion algebra generated by 1 ij and ij. Unfortunately, it's not quite the case, because what you find here, well, it is indeed a subring of the uh, quaternion algebra, but it is not maximal. And the endomorphism ring is supposed to be maximal. It means that something's missing in there. But not much is missing. In fact, you can just add, add a few half elements in this ring and figure that you have everything. And then this is isomorphic to that order in the quaternion algebra. And you're done. You've computed the endomorphism ring of this elliptic curve E0. What we've showed here is that for this elliptic curve E0, which is very special, it is easy to compute the endomorphism ring. But this is an exception. This is not typical behavior. This is really because this curve is special. In general, if I give you an arbitrary supersingular elliptic curve, it's going to be very hard to compute the endomorphism ring of E. We don't know how to do this efficiently. And this is what we call the endomorphism ring problem. Given a supersingular elliptic curve, can you compute the endomorphism ring of this curve? More precisely, this problem comes in two variants. The first variant is end ring, and is maybe the most natural one. This variant asks for you to find four endomorphisms of the elliptic curve E that form a basis of the endomorphism ring. This gives you explicit endomorphisms, but it doesn't really give you the algebraic structure. And that's the second variant. Max order is you are given a super single elliptic curve, and you are asked to find an order in the quaternion algebra that is isomorphic to the endomorphism ring. So now you don't find actual explicit endomorphisms, but you find the algebraic structure of the endomorphism ring. OK, the isogeny path problem. If you look at all the super singular elliptic curves over um, a field of characteristic p, you will find that there are about p over 12 of them, and all of them are defined over fp squared. So it's never useful to go in larger extension uh, of fp than just fp squared. So they form a finite set, which I write s s of p. So now we fix a prime l. Think about l as a small prime, 2 or 3. Now the l isogeny graph is the following. The set of vertices are all the super singular elliptic curves defined over fp squared. 
and you have an edge from an elliptic curve E to an elliptic curve F if and only if there exists an isogeny of degree L from E to F. So remember that an isogeny of degree L is an isogeny whose kernel has size L. And amazingly, this graph is connected. Not only it is connected, but it is very strongly connected. Between any two vertices of this graph, there exists a very short path. Even though the graph can be gigantic, points can never be very far away from each other. So, the L isogeny path problem is just pathfinding in this graph. You're given two super single elliptic curves, E and F, meaning two vertices in this isogeny graph, and you are asked to find a path from E to F, meaning a sequence of isogenies of degree L that connect E to F. Now I have presented all three problems involved in the main result, so I can state it. And the main result is that they are all equivalent under probabilistic polynomial time reductions and assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Previously, there were some known heuristic reductions between these problems proved in these two articles. And the contribution in this new article is that um, these problems are indeed equivalent, not just heuristically, but assuming only the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Okay, I'm going to try in the time that remains to give you an idea of how we go about proving that these things are equivalent. And the main tool we are using is a solution to the quaternion path problem. So we have two worlds, a world of super singular elliptic curves and the world of maximal orders in a quaternion algebra. And to go from one to the other, you are given an elliptic curve E then its endomorphism ring is an order in the quaternion algebra. And in fact, this map is essentially one-to-one. -one. If you look at elliptic curves up to isomorphism, it cor they correspond to essentially one maximal order in the quaternion algebra. Now, it's not just a correspondence between these objects, elliptic curves and maximal orders. It's also a correspondence between maps between these objects. If you have an isogeny from an elliptic curve E to an elliptic curve E prime, then it corresponds to an ideal that is what we call an O O prime ideal, where O is isomorphic to the endomorphism ring of E, and O prime is isomorphic to the endomorphism ring of E prime. So this ideal it can be thought of as a, a morphism from O to O prime, just like the isogeny phi is a morphism from E to E prime. Now we can get two variants of the isogeny path problem. The n isogeny path problem is when you're given e and e prime, can you find an isogeny from e to e prime of degree n? And on the quaternion world, the equivalent problem would be the n quaternion path problem, where you're given two orders o and o prime, can you find an ideal that connects them, that has norm n? The main tool for proving the equivalence between all three problems that I mentioned previously is a solution to this quaternion path problem. And we prove that, assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis, there exists an algorithm that solves the n quaternion path problem as soon as n is large enough, an expected polynomial time. And the proof of this theorem is uh, really the main difficulty of the result. It's the technical core of the paper. Here again, there were previously known heuristic algorithms from Coel, Lauter, Petit, and Tignol. So, again, we have two worlds. We have the isogeny world on one side and the quaternion world on the other side. And now we've identified that the isogeny path problem on the isogeny world, well, it seems hard, we don't know how to solve it, but on the quaternion side, the equivalent problem is easy. So the question is, can you pass from one world to the other? And that is essentially what max order does. Max order, remember, it takes as input an elliptic curve E and computes an order in the quaternion algebra isomorphic to the endomorphism ring. So if you have a max order oracle, you can transfer problems about isogenies to problems about quaternions, which we know how to solve. And this is essentially the idea behind how to use a max order oracle to solve the uh, L isogeny path problem. Thank you for your attention.